right, you can be seated. All right, you ready to get into the word today? All right, go ahead and stand for the reading of God's word. Glad to have Jenny and Larry back. I've got my water today. Thank you. <laughs> All right, everybody say, let's go. Rise and shine. That's, help me preach. Look at your neighbor. Say, arise and shine. <laughs> rise and sh- arise, shine. Now you're adding words in there. <laughs> arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, the deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you for your presence. Thank you, Lord, for powerful worship service. Thank you for a worshiping church, a praying church. And Father, we're gathered in your name to hear from you. We didn't come to hear a preacher today. We didn't come to hear a band, but we came to meet with you, Holy Spirit. So I want you to take a moment, say, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me today, Lord. Father, we want to hear your voice. We want to know that when we leave here today that you've spoken to our hearts and we've been transformed into your likeness, becoming more like you every time we get together because we've been in your presence. Thank you, Jesus. Father, we give you the next few moments of our life just to speak to our hearts. In Jesus' name, if you love him, shout amen. 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 You can be seated. Let's read this again. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord is risen upon you. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and deep darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Did you know that God's glory is supposed to be seen upon you? Did you know that? That's what we're going to talk about. Everybody say glory. Glory. Some people say that this passage is talking about the millennial reign, the thousand year reign of Christ, but it says that darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. When Christ comes back to reign, there won't be any darkness, right? So it's not talking about the millennium, it's talking about right now. Right now, you and I are seeing more darkness than we've ever experienced before. Would you agree? (laughs) You just turn on the TV and you see it. Not just the news, just the filth that they send through. They call it, I've talked to Spook about some of you guys. It's like, they call it entertainment. In this movie, we murdered 100 people. That's entertainment? That's darkness. Are you with me? So look at verse 2. It says, For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth, and great darkness the people. But the Lord will arise over you, and his glory will be seen upon you. Here's the good news. You're not the word people. You're the you right there. For behold, the darkness shall cover the earth and deep darkness the people. That's not us. But the Lord will arise over you. Everybody say, that's me. me. And his glory will be seen upon you. God is going to arise over you and his glory will be seen upon you, on your face. So when there's darkness in the world, God's glory and his favor is supposed to shine upon his people. We're supposed to look different. Amen? Let's go to verse 3. And Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Now, we have to understand that this has two different meanings. In the natural, this is written, of course, to Israel, meaning that when Jesus returns, God will exalt the nation of Israel and Christ will rule from there, and the purpose that God had for Israel will be fulfilled, okay? Because they rejected Jesus as their Messiah, but he's not done with them yet. Somebody say amen. Amen. He's not finished. So then the second, in the spirit, we could say the spiritual application, this is for the church. So Gentiles means unbelievers will come to your light. The unbelievers shall come to your light. They should come to us because they say there's something different about him. There's something different about her. Anybody know what I'm talking about? So this is what it's saying. This isn't a glory that has to be spiritually discerned. This is a glory that the world will be able to see upon the believer. The Gentiles shall come to your light and kings to the brightness of your rising. Kings. These are important people. This means that bosses, leaders, people of influence are going to be drawn to you, kings to the brightness of your rising. That means that you might get a promotion simply because you're a child of the king. Your boss says, I don't know what it is about you, but whenever you come into work, the atmosphere changes. Let's give that person a promotion. Are you with me? This happens. Somebody say amen. Amen. All right, let's go to verse four. Lift up your eyes all around and see, they all gather together, they come to you, your sons shall come from afar, and your daughters shall be nursed at your side. When God's glory rests upon you, your family members who have wandered off will come back. They'll be attracted to God's glory. They've gone astray, but the glory of God will begin to draw them back into your life. I want you to help me preach, point to three people, tell them, I see God's glory on you. 
I see God's glory on you. Amen. Whenever you did that, every face in the room lit up. And then I saw God's glory on your face. I mean, that's awesome. All right, verse 5. Then you shall see and become radiant, radiant, <laughs> and your heart shall swell with joy because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. You'll become radiant. Your heart will swell with joy. Abundance and wealth is going to be attracted to you. It's going to be drawn to you. The glory of God that is upon you will attract abundance and wealth. Is that my opinion or is that what the word of God says? Then you shall see and become radiant because the glory of God is upon us and your heart shall swell with joy. How many need joy? The joy of the Lord is our strength because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you. The wealth of the Gentiles shall come to you. This is a really big deal. We don't hear many sermons on this, but it's so important because the radiance of God's glory on your face actually attracts blessings into your life. Does it say the poverty of the Gentiles shall come upon you? The leftovers? What does it say? The wealth of the Gentiles. When you are radiant, good things happen to you. When you have the glory of God resting upon you, amazing things happen. You just can't help it. There are many people in the church who have been saved, but they never let their face know. <laughs> Not up in here, right? <laughs> Bless God, I've been saved for 40 years. I'm on my way to heaven, right? And the world's going, maybe I don't want to go to heaven. <laughs> are you with me? All right, 2 Corinthians 3.6. We'll just keep on moving. <laughs> Just say, I have the glory of the Lord all over me. I mean, it changes everything. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter kills, but the spirit gives what? Life. Life. Remember when God gave the law on Mount Sinai and Moses came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments? Remember that? Ted, you were there, right? Oh, I'm, I'm teasing. I'm messing with him. My little snob just... <laughs> I'm kidding. I was going to say it to Al, but... <laughs> we love you. Next, I don't know if you can hear me or not. Next week is his birthday, okay? Is next week your birthday? Your birthday next week? Yeah, he can't hear me, but... So we're going to bless him next week, all right? <laughs> Where was I? I'm so sorry. I, I love Ted. So he came, yeah, thank you, he came down Mount Sinai. Moses came down the mountain with the Ten Commandments. The people were worshiping a golden calf. Let's go back and look at this. Then you shall see and become radiant, and your heart shall swell with joy, because the abundance of the sea shall be turned to you in the wealth. I don't think that's right, is it? No, Exodus 32. There we are. All right, we're back. Now, when Moses saw that the people were unrestrained, for Aaron had not restrained them to their shame among their enemies... All right. Then Moses stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on the Lord's side, come to me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves together to him. Verse 27. And he said to them, Thus says the Lord God of Israel, Let every man put his sword on his side and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp. And let every man kill his brother, every man his companion, and every man his neighbor. Verse 28. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moses, and about how many men? 3,000 men of the people fell that day. So the law is given, and 3,000 people were killed. See that? And then we read in the book of Acts that after Peter's filled with the Holy Spirit, he starts preaching. How many people get saved? 3, Acts chapter 2. Here we go. And with many other words, he testified and exhorted them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. Then those who gladly received his word were baptized, and that day about 3,000 souls were added to them. Here's my point. When the law entered on Mount Sinai, 3,000 people were killed. But under grace, on another mountain, Mount Zion, 3,000 people were saved. You see that? Go ahead, give the Lord praise. The law brings death. Grace brings life. Now let's go back to 2 Corinthians 3, verse 6. Who also made us sufficient as ministers of the new covenant, not of the letter, but of the spirit. For the letter, what? 
kills, 3,000 died, but the Spirit gives life. Now you know what it means when it says the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. All right, verse 7. But if the ministry of what? Death. Death, written and engraved on stones, was glorious, so that the children of Israel could not look steadily at the face of Moses because of the glory. Everybody say glory. Glory. Glory of his countenance. They couldn't look at the face of Moses because the glory of his countenance, which glory was what? Passing away. God calls the Ten Commandments a ministry of death, but it was glorious. So Moses puts a veil on to cover the glory of his face. This was actually very smart because the glory was fading away. So if they say, well, on Sunday I saw Pastor Moses, he had the glory of the Lord, but on Tuesday the glory was gone. He was actually smart. He was hiding it from the people. Because they'd say, oh, there's sin in your life. Because I saw you on Sunday morning, Pastor Moses, and I saw the glory of the Lord all over you. You must have done something wrong because now it's fading away. See that? So he covers it to hide it from the people, but in the presence of the Lord, he takes the veil off. Everybody see that? Here's my point. If the glory of God showed up in a tangible way on the face of Moses, where everyone could see it, and he was under the law, the ministry of death, how much more is God's glory supposed to show up on your face under the new covenant of grace? Are you seeing this? All right, verses 8 and 9. How will the ministry of the Spirit not be more glorious? If Moses had it, right? For if the ministry of condemnation had glory, the ministry of righteousness exceeds what? Much more in glory. In this passage, we see the law called the ministry of death and the ministry of condemnation. And it was fading away. But there's a much more glorious ministry right now, the ministry of righteousness. Whose righteousness? Jesus' righteousness. This ought to be a big eye-opener for the church. Because people who are teaching the law, do this, don't do that, a list of rules, a list of do's and don'ts, people who say you're righteous as long as you're living right until you sin, the Bible says that they're teaching a ministry of death and a ministry of condemnation. It's no wonder Christians feel like giving up by Tuesday. Are you with me? Here's what I want you to see. If that ministry of death and condemnation was glorious, how much more glorious should this new covenant be? The ministry of righteousness. Amen? Amen? So let's break it down even further. Has anybody ever been to an old tent meeting back in the day? Raise your hand. Oh, some of us. All right. I, I was born in 1975. I caught the tail end of that. So I was the little guy in the little playpen. My dad was playing guitar on the platform and probably preaching. All I remember is the heat. Anybody remember that? <laughs> and the bugs. All right. I got to tell you this one story. They, they told me I was too little to know what was going on, but there were June bugs. Everybody know what June bug is? And they were worshiping and praising the Lord, and it went zzzz, and went down a lady's top. She came, whoa! And they thought the Holy Spirit got her. I'm, I'm serious. <laughs> They're like, man, God's really moving, and that bug was all over the place. Anyway, that's a story we still laugh about. <laughs> it's funny. But it, it was hot back then, right? So you remember that. People were saved. They were healed. They were delivered. They were set free. There was glory there. But God is saying, I have so much more for my people who are under, uh, that's all right, under the, the ministry of righteousness. Because what did the, a lot of those preachers, what were they preaching? The law. In the old time tent meetings, what was it? Sin, 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 sin. But there was glory there. Are you seeing this? There were, people were healed, delivered, set free. They were saved. But now under the ministry of righteousness, a group of people who understands the gospel of Christ, the gospel of grace, There should be much more glory every time we get together. Amen. Let's give the Lord praise. When you understand grace, God says, I have so much more glory for you. As wonderful as those tent meetings were, as wonderful as the the healing revivals and all of that, God says, I'm switching things. Are you with me? It's a revelation. Look at your neighbor and say, I see God's glory all over you. It's so awesome. Matthew 17, verses 1 and 2. Now after six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves, and he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. This is the Mount of Transfiguration. The glory of God was on Jesus' face. Now watch this. When the glory was on Moses under the law, the people ran in fear. But when the glory was on Jesus under grace, people came to him. Matthew 17, verse 14. 
I just want to show you this real quick. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd was waiting for them. Remember Moses with Mount Sinai? 3,000 were killed. He actually pushed them away. They don't want to be around that. At the foot of the mountain, a large crowd now was waiting for them, and a man came and knelt before Jesus and said, what I want you to see is people now are gathering to the glory of God that's all over him. It attracts people. Are you seeing this? The law says you're sinful, you're unclean, but grace says you've been made righteous. You believe in Jesus as your Savior. Amen. It's that easy. Look at your neighbor say it's that easy. Now here's where we've been headed all morning. We're almost there. The glory of God is supposed to be on your face. Your countenance is supposed to radiate with God's glory. Psalm 42 verse 11. David says, why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. Everybody say hope in God. For I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. David was depressed when he said this, but then he starts to encourage himself. Have you ever had to encourage yourself? Yes. <laughs> Many times, right? He says, why are you discouraged? Self, why are you depressed? Why are you going through this? Hope in God. Your hope is in God. Your hope cannot be in your pastor. Your hope cannot be in your church. Your hope cannot be in your husband or your wife or your kids or your grandchildren. Somebody say Amen. amen. Your hope has to be in God. Hope is believing that there are better days out in front of me. There are better days than I've experienced so far. As wonderful maybe as your life has been, God has a better plan. Amen? Amen. I'm believing that God has a great plan for my life. I'm believing that it won't always be like this. I've told you before, there were times in our lives and we just put our arm around each other and say, it's not always going to be like this. Struggling, going through some tough, very tough situations in our life. We didn't have anything to do other than say, I know it won't always be like this. Why? My hope wasn't in her. Her hope wasn't in me. Our hope together was in God. Somebody say amen. Amen. Touch three people. Tell them I have hope. I have hope. We're just going to have church. You've already been hugging anyway. You can touch your neighbor. It's all right. (laughs) Jeremiah 29, 11. Say it again. Say, I have hope. hope. Amen. That's awesome. For I know the thoughts that I think toward you, says the Lord. Do you know God's thinking about you right now? Says the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a what? Thoughts of peace and not of evil to give you a future and a hope. I don't know what you're going through right now, but I've come to let you know God has a great future for you. Even if you say, Joe, my life's wonderful. It couldn't get any better. It can get better. You have to believe it. God is guiding me to the plan that he has for my life. He's given me a future and a hope. I believe he only wants the best for me. I believe he only wants to bless me. I believe he wants to prosper me. Amen? Amen. When you are filled with hope, looking to the future with great expectancy, it will change your countenance. When you're filled with hope, I'm hoping for a great future. I know God's, my hope is in God. I know he's going to take care, of, take care of me. Looking to the future with great expectancy, it will change the way you look, your countenance. Somebody say amen. amen. If you're here today and you're discouraged or you're struggling with depression, you need to start praying for God to give you his hope. When I'm filled with hope, I live life expecting to see amazing things happen. I get out of bed expecting to be blessed. Somebody say amen. Amen. I wake up expecting to hear his voice. Look at the person next to you and tell them, hope is rising on the inside of me. Amen, it is. Where there was depression, now I have hope. Where there was worry, now I have hope. Where there was lack, now I have hope. Where there was sickness, now I have hope. Where there was discouragement, depression, now I have hope. Just say, I have hope. I'm filled with hope. All right, verse 11. Psalm 42, verse 11. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God, for I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance and my God. For I shall yet praise him. David asked himself, why am I so discouraged? Why am I feeling sorry for myself? Have you ever asked yourself that? Oh, you guys don't ever feel sorry for yourself, do you? Why am I feeling sorry for myself? Yes, what's going on with me? I know what to do. I'll hope in God and I will praise him. Do you know that you can literally praise your way out of depression? What's the first thing? I don't know about you, but for me, when I get depressed and get discouraged, the first thing I want to do is just clam up. I do not want to talk about it. Anybody else? You get discouraged and you're just, what's going on with you, brother? Nothing. Because the enemy knows that if I keep my mouth shut, I can't praise my way out. So he wants you to keep your mouth shut. Are you with me? I don't feel like singing today. I don't feel like going to church today. 
I'm too discouraged. I'm too depressed. That's the day you need to be in church. Somebody say amen. Amen. This is exactly where you need to be. Well, Joe, you don't understand. God feels like he's a million miles away. Well, the Bible tells us that he inhabits the praises of his people. That word inhabits in the Greek means that he literally comes and he sits down in the middle of our praise. So when we were praising earlier and we were worshiping, God says, oh, over there at Freedom Life, they're worshiping me. Here I come, right into the service. And then what happens when the presence of God is in the room and his presence is fullness of joy at his right hand pleasure forevermore? Here comes joy. The joy of the Lord is my So all of a sudden as I'm worshiping, I'm getting stronger spiritually, but also physically. Somebody say amen. amen. As we're worshiping, here comes healing into the room. Here comes financial breakthrough. Whatever you need is in the presence of the Lord. Amen. Remember Paul and Cyr- Cy- Cyrus, Silas, Paul and Silas were, were worshiping in the inner sanctum of the, of the prison. And the doors flung open as they're worshiping. People say that was to get them out. Their chains fell off. I believe what happened is God says, oh, they're worshiping over there in the prison. Here I come. And the doors flew open so the presence of God could get in. Amen? That's what's happening. Somebody say amen. Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, praise is a weapon. If he feels far away from you, a million miles away, start worshiping. Start praising him. Amen. This is how I fight my battles. (laughs) <laughs> right? We just sang about it. I worship through the battle. I praise. I shout through them. If you were to walk in in this room during the week on your pastor, don't check the cameras either, and see me worshiping, I don't know if you'd come back. <laughs> you say, that boy has lost his mind. Who's he talking to in there? Who's he singing to? Who's he jumping up down? Why is he running? What's wrong with that guy? Because when I get alone in the presence of the Lord, I just worship like, well, nobody's here, but I just worship from my heart. Are you with me? So when you get the struggle, you're going, whatever you're going through today, I feel like I'm ministering to somebody. You get that struggle, and I just can't seem to get out of this. I dare you to worship. I dare you to get caught up in the presence of the Lord and let him minister to you. David said he danced before the Lord. Have you ever danced before the Lord? I have. You look like a fool. You feel like an idiot. But then all of a sudden, then all of a sudden you start laughing, and here comes the joy. Here comes the strength. Here comes the healing. Amen? Amen. Look at your neighbor and say, get in his presence. Get in his presence. You have to do that. I'll praise him when things are going good. I'll praise him when things are going bad, when they're falling apart. So can we just talk? I want to challenge you. Go deeper into worship. I know we're worried about what someone might think about us. But I want to challenge you. Go deep into his presence. Don't worry about the person next to you. You realize that some people in this room... They're on the verge of a breakthrough. They are this close. They're at the threshold, ready to step into the breakthrough. And if they could just worship, they would receive what they've been believing for. But they may go, oh man, I don't want to offend them. I wonder what they're thinking. That's what freedom is all about, is I don't care what you're thinking. I came to worship. Amen. You realize you could be this close to your breakthrough, whatever you're believing God for. There could be someone in the room who's so discouraged, so depressed, and they just don't know how to get their breakthrough, but they look over and see you freely worshiping the Lord in church. And they're like, if they can do it, I can do it. And they begin to raise their hands. It's awesome. I don't know how many testimonies I've heard through the years of people in here. And they said, I, was, I felt like worshiping. I wanted to really enter in. And I looked over and saw so-and-so doing it. And I thought, if they could do it, I can do it. And they got their breakthrough. Somebody say amen. amen. Some of you, you don't know this, you've been an encouragement to others. Sometimes it just takes one person to step out and to freely worship in spirit and in truth. I remember one time, this is several years ago, Reuben, when he was still with us, he, he got up in the middle, I think it was I Am Free, and he started walking around. And before you know it, there's like nine guys behind him making this train around in the middle of worship. Men! You know what I did? I just started crying. I couldn't help it. (laughs) I was like, man, God's moving. It wasn't a show. It was just, we have a freedom in the presence of God and I can just worship him however I want. And they just took off marching. It was awesome. Somebody say amen. Amen. The glory is here. Psalm 42, 11, check this out. Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are you disquieted within me? Hope in God. I have to have my hope in him. For I shall yet praise him, the help of my countenance in my God. The help of my countenance. How does God change your countenance? Why does he radiate from your face? Because you've been filled with hope and because you're praising him. 
It changes everything. I remember, we're almost finished. I remember when I started leading worship in Charleston. Julie and I were over there and we came back to Mattoon and we ate at Cody's. Anybody remember Cody's? We ate at Cody's and I walked in and there was a pastor there, a friend of mine. And he says, man, what happened in your church? You have a good service today? I was like, yeah. He says, I can see it all over your face. And that, right around that time, I don't know if it was this morning or not, but worship became real intense at this church. And in the middle of worship, people were literally running to the altar, getting right with the Lord. They were just literally running down. So I was just beaming. I was like, man, God is moving every Sunday. And I walked into the restaurant and he's, basically he said, the glory of the Lord's on you. It's on your face. He said, I can see you had a good service. That's what we're supposed to have every time that we leave here. That's what we're supposed to have. You ready? Every day. Because you don't need a church to worship. You don't need a band to worship. You don't need a preacher. You just need your heart connected to his heart. And then it changes your countenance. Somebody say amen. amen. Our faces are supposed to show the world that we belong to Jesus. And our faces are supposed to show the world that we've been with Jesus. If Moses experienced the glory under the law, how much more should you and I experience the glory under grace? It should change our countenance. I've seen it many times as people come forward and they get saved or they rededicate their life or whatever and their countenance changes, especially with youth, working with youth. And they're, they're, they just change. They just change. It's amazing. I'll, I'll tell you real quick. There was one girl that was struggling with some things. I won't tell you what they are. And she wore all black all the time. And that's okay. If you wear black, I wear a lot of black. Black and gray. Right, Todd? Gray? <laughs> but she wore that all the time. The Lord found her and she got saved. And the next couple of weeks we noticed and we were laughing about it. She started wearing pink and purple because not only this changed her countenance, not only her heart, but now there's fruit and it changed on the outside. Her whole life changed. Her music changed. Are you with me? See, the mistake the church has made is change your music, get right with the Lord. Don't dress like that. Get right with the Lord. How about get right with the Lord and he'll take care of the rest. Amen. I never one time said, change your music. I never one time said, don't dress goth. You need to dress like, you can dress however you want. It's your heart he's looking at. Man looks on the outward appearance. God looks at your heart. Amen. Go ahead and stand to your feet. I want you to pray this with me. Say, say, Lord, I want to see your glory. And I want the world to see your glory on my face. I want to say that again from your heart. Say, Lord, I want to see your glory. And I want the world to see your glory on my face. His glory is supposed to be resting upon us. Well, usually when I close in prayer on Sunday mornings, I say, Lord, your, we want your presence on the inside, but also resting upon us. That's his glory resting upon us. Peter's shadow healed people. He never touched him because God's glory was resting. His presence was resting upon him.